Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson of the Aspen Institute. It's nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces here. Uh, it's going to be my pleasure to uh, turn things over in a minute to my colleague, Jane Wales, who's uh, vice president of the Institute and runs our uh, philanthropy and social innovation program, who will have uh, moderate a conversation with our distinguished guest. And we will leave, as always, uh, plenty of time for a conversation uh, among all of us. Uh, I also want to thank Jane uh, for really being the inspiration for this series uh, of conversations that we've had with uh, leaders of important foundations in the United States. This, I think, is the fourth, is it, Jane, that, that, it that, that we've had uh, with Stephen Heinz from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, uh, Bob Gallucci from the MacArthur Foundation, and most recently Rita Roy. Uh, from the MasterCard Foundation. Uh, Jim Canales, uh, you all have his biography. I'm sure you all uh, uh, know of Jim and the very uh, important work done by the James Irvine Foundation, of which he is president and chief executive officer. Uh, you also see some of the things that he did before he joined the foundation and the continuing uh, uh, involvement he has in the worlds of uh, philanthropy and uh, in myriad ways improving communities, not just in California, the focus of the Irvine Foundation, but nationally. Uh, uh, the uh, James Irvine Foundation has, and I, I hope and expect with, uh, in Jane's conversation, uh, Jim will spend a little bit of time uh, talking. For those of you who may not be as familiar with it, it's, uh, it's unique in, in a number of ways. Uh, it's focused just on California. Uh, that's nothing anyone could ever apologize for, given the size of California and its importance. And so it obviously has, uh, what they do has global implications. The focus on, on, uh, on the arts, uh, on democracy, uh, in particular, obviously, in, in California, and youth. Uh, the foundation was established in 1937. Uh, uh, by the agricultural pioneer, uh, James Irvine, to promote the general well-being of citizens and residents in the state of California. And the mission ever since has been to expand opportunity for Californians uh, to participate in a vibrant, uh, successful, and uh, inclusive society. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention, uh, we are very fortunate to have him here because of the coincidence that just yesterday uh, the White House Council for Community Solutions uh, reported out its uh, recommendations to the public. Uh, Jim is uh, a member of that White House Council. Uh, I was delighted to be there uh, uh, as the recommendations were presented. I'm sure he will also have a chance to talk about the Council a bit. And I'm very pleased to say that a key element of the Council uh, is going to be uh, run here from the Aspen Institute uh, based on some of its key recommendations about uh, how we can focus on some of the programs uh, that are occurring around the country that really do as uh, uh, move the needle substantially in terms of impact, impact of any kind in a community, whether it's impact on uh, increasing uh, high school graduation rates, reducing teenage pregnancy, uh, reducing violence, improving employment. There are many examples around the country of, of things that have happened that really make a huge difference. And, and the, the idea is how to leverage those successes multifold around the country. Uh, that effort is going to be housed here along with an incentive program to reinforce these efforts. And I'm delighted to say, and this is actually the very first day, so you were among the very first to know this, that the chair of this effort uh, will be Melody Barnes, uh, who was assistant to the president and head of the Domestic uh, Policy Council for President Obama. Uh, as of today, she is uh, uh, an employee of the Aspen Institute. We're, we're delighted. And uh, we are very appreciative of uh, the great work done by the council, which is now our continuing mission here at the Institute. And with that, I will turn things over to Jane uh, to uh, probably say a little bit more. They've been friends for some time and begin the conversation. Thanks so much, Elliot. Um, actually, yes, I, I have the pleasure of, of being a, a fellow San Franciscan along with Jim. And so uh, we, we, in fact, even live in the same neighborhood. Uh, and so I happen to know he's a superstar. Um, what, what was your age, Jim, when you became president of Irvine? Uh, 36. 
Uh, needless to say, nobody of that age had had a major foundation in California or anywhere, as far as I can tell. Um, let's let's start with talking about the White House Council and its mission, because you've, you've dedicated uh, a good deal of time and energy to your service there. Talk a little bit about its purpose and how it's going to be uh, be pursuing its goals. Terrific. And before I dive into that, let me just express my gratitude to each of you for taking time from your busy schedules uh, to be with us here today uh, in this fantastic space, by the way. It's hard to beat the view. Uh, as Jane said to me when I sat down, don't get too distracted looking out the window there. Uh, and it's a pleasure, obviously, to be in conversation with my friend Jane Wales, for whom I have so much admiration and respect. The White House Council was established in December of 2010 by the President, and the mandate to the Council was effectively to go out and look at how community solutions could be better advanced across this country. And we ended up then taking that mandate in two different directions. Uh, one direction was heeding to what we were asked to do, which is to look at a range of efforts taking place across the country where community solutions were being effectively implemented on a range of issues, whether it was teen pregnancy, dropout rates, uh, lowering incarceration rates, whatever the issue might be, but really scanning the country to see what was it that made particular community collaboratives more effective than others. And there's a piece of work that we've done there, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But then the second area that emerged from our work is as we started to do this work, we realized that there was a significant need that was really going unnoticed by many people around the country. And this need was a, focused on a population that we originally called disconnected youth and we are now calling opportunity youth. This is a group of youth who now number in the 6.7 million uh, in the United States. These are youth between the ages of 16 to 24 who are both out of school and out of work. And it is, as you can imagine, a significant number of, of youth, and it is also a significant problem for this country if those youth do not find ways to reconnect to employment and or education. And in fact, one of the things that we did as a council is we commissioned a study by Columbia University to look at the costs of not tending to this need. And in 2011 alone, the costs of this population to the country, both in direct costs in social services and also in foregone earnings, if you will, as a country, because these youth were not working, was $93 billion. And when you begin to extrapolate that out over the lifetime of this population, you get into the trillions. So we ultimately realized that this was an area that we really needed to focus on as a council and figure out how we could mobilize action, use the bully pulpit of the White House to draw attention to this population. This was really the focus of a White House summit that we held yesterday um, at the White House on disconnected youth. And we actually, Elliot was able to be there for a part of it. It was a terrific session. We had youth in the audience, which was uh, fantastic, and very inspiring stories of students, of young people who have turned their lives around through the interventions of many, many efforts across this country that are successfully addressing the needs of this population. So it's an important area. I'm glad that the Aspen Institute is going to be picking up some of the work. Clearly, the work of the council, viewed as an 18-month effort, is now concluded, and it was never going to be an effort that was going to lead to solutions on all of these issues, but we wanted to draw attention to these two particular areas and then hopefully seed some work that is now going to happen in a number of other settings across this country, which we're very excited about. What is, a, what is the role of funding collaboratives in all of this, sort of a locally based, I'm thinking of something like Strive in Ohio and other, other collaborative efforts that involve multiple community organizations as well as local foundations. Great. So one of the things that we did as a council, and this was really this first body of work that I described around looking at community solutions across the country and seeing what some common characteristics uh, were. Our work began at the time that I'm sure many of you are familiar with the article that Foundation Strategy Group did called Collective Impact, uh, which was really a piece of work that was really making the case for the need for people from all sectors to come together to address their community concerns. And it's a very well done uh, piece of work. So we now wanted to build on that work and really now study community collaboratives across this country that had been needle moving. That was the term that we used. And we defined needle moving as literally changing the data on their particular issue by at least 10 percent. Um, so if it was increasing something in a positive way, it was increased by 10 percent, and if it was decreasing something negative, it was decreasing that by 10 percent. And we studied these collaboratives. We worked with the Bridgespan Group um, to look at what made these collaboratives particularly effective. 
And one of the outputs that you will see in the recommendations of the council and that we've now released on our website, which is serve.gov, uh, because we're probably not going to have time to go into all the detail today, but I would commend you to serve.gov, which is the website um, for the work of the council. One of the things that we have released is a study that captures some of the key elements that made these collaboratives um, effective. And some of the elements that we think are important as other collaboratives are being formed and as we're trying to figure out how we address these intractable problems across the country. Clearly, the role of private foundations um, is, is critical, but I think one of the outcomes of this work is the realization that, as the collective impact study pointed out, it really is about all sectors coming together and having a shared goal. Uh, data collection and really rigorous data collection is an important element uh, to the work as well. And clearly, I think this is something that's a little bit more intangible in nature. But another important part of all of this work, of course, is people being able to leave their egos at the door and come together for the benefit of the community. And I think that's probably one of the more challenging lessons when you're trying to do community collaborations, and in particular, and we can talk about this a little later, trying to do funding collaborations. I'm actually going to probably take you to some questions or others, Will, about data. Um, but, but real quick, I, I want to just take a, a deeper look on the downside, the sort of cost to society, and ask about incarceration rates for kids of this, of this age cohort. And what is the cost to society, but also what is the cost to them? And once you've served uh, in prison, what are your options at that point? Right. Now, so the, the council, interestingly enough, and this was a point of contention uh, at some at some in some respects. We, our focus on disconnected youth does not include incarcerated youth. So there were a number of, there were segments of the youth population whose needs are so profound, whether it was incarcerated youth, youth that had significant mental health needs, um, youth that were foster youth, those were not included in that 6.7 million count. So we were really trying to segment the populations that we felt we had the ability to reach and to reconnect to employment and to education. Mm -hmm. So as a result, my knowledge of sort of the, the numbers of incarcerated youth, obviously the, the needs, um, is less significant than, than knowing about the general population. But certainly in our work in California, even though the Irvine Foundation doesn't work directly with this population, and we'll talk a little bit about the work that we do in California because it relates to this topic, but clearly we know that the cost of incarcerating a young person in California is so much more significant than the cost of educating them even in a four-year private college. Um, and moreover, we know that the recidivism rates are such that when those youth are then released, the chances of their returning to prison are fairly significant. And this becomes, as you can imagine, a huge issue with profound impacts. Um, and as I say, the work of the council, this 6.7 million youth, doesn't even include that segment of incarcerated youth in this country. So talk a little bit about how this work, the work of the council, overlaps with the Irvine Foundation's work. And in particular, I'd love it if you'd focus in on linked learning. Great. So in California, so let me just take a moment to say a little bit about the Irvine Foundation. Elliot provided some uh, context in his opening comments. So our foundation has assets of about $1.5 billion. We grant approximately $68 million a year. And as Elliot pointed out, there are a number of features to the work of the Irvine Foundation that, that are interesting, that are unique at some level. One is we are a regional foundation. We are focused only on California, and that was uh, by the in the trust that our founder left. So that's something that we cannot change. Um, and at the same time, the founder did not designate particular areas of focus for the Irvine Foundation. He left it to the trustees to evolve over time and to be able to determine over time what the needs were for the state of California that the Irvine Foundation might focus on. So we have no particular mandate from uh, James Irvine in terms of what we can fund other than funding solely in California. And that is somewhat unique. In addition to that, while we are a foundation with a family name, we are not a family foundation. We do not have any Irvine family members on our board, so we operate much more as an independent foundation than we do a family foundation. Uh, so these are some interesting characteristics about um, the work of the foundation that I just think are worth sharing. So about nine years ago, when I became CEO, we were concluding a strategic planning process at the foundation, and this was the first comprehensive planning process we had done in about 15 years. And that process led us to a focus on youth between the ages of 14 and 24. And I can talk about how we got there, but that was really one of the areas that we wanted to focus on. And we particularly wanted to focus on low-income youth in that age cohort 
And we especially wanted to focus on having those students graduate high school on time and receive a post-secondary credential by the age of 25. And as you can see, this focus on this cohort and the goals very much tied to the work of the White House Council on Disconnected Youth, even though the focus of the Irvine work in an area we call linked learning is not solely about disconnected youth. It's really more within the higher, I mean, within the high school system. So what are we doing uh, to address the needs of this population? Well, one of the things that we did early on in our work, and this is something that I would commend more foundations to do, is to go to the population you're trying to serve and figure out what they need. And so we did that. We went to youth themselves who were at risk of dropping out of high school, and we wanted to understand why they were dropping out of high school. And what we learned is not going to be a surprise to many of you in this room, but what we learned is that they find the high school education irrelevant to their lives. And the primary reason that youth are dropping out in California based on the work that we have done, is that they find the high school experience just irrelevant. It is not relevant to the lives that they are leading today, and it's certainly not relevant to the lives that they foresee in the future, particularly since many of them don't necessarily see themselves on a college track. So what we wanted to focus on was how could we reinvent a system of education that had previously been called vocational education, that is now being called career and technical education, into something that would marry a rigorous academic program so that these youth would also be prepared for post-secondary study with a core technical part of study, a, a work-based aspect that would then make them, that would make the educational experience more relevant but would also prepare them for career options even after high school and in some cases after post-secondary if that's the path that they chose to go on. So we created a field, we are building a field in California that we are calling linked learning. And we tested it in a number of school sites across the state, and we have now scaled up to work in nine high school districts in California. And this is a very heavy lift, because what we are doing is we are working with principals on how you restructure the education experience so that you can have this work-based experience, this rigorous academic experience, support services for these students as well. We are working with teachers to re-envision how teaching is delivered in very different ways. One of the high schools in California that we are supporting is a group called Health Professions High in Sacramento. This is a high school that is based in a very low-income neighborhood. We visited it on numerous occasions. You go there, these are all kids who are low-income, living in housing projects that are literally across the street from the high school. When you show up, everybody is dressed in scrubs. This is a school that is preparing students for health professions. When you walk into a classroom, it is not the kind of classroom setting that we all might remember with a teacher in the front and 30 seats in, in, in you know, sort of arranged in classroom style. It is highly interactive. Every class links back to the focus of health and health care so that it is a more relevant experience because these kids are interested in health professions. So what does history have to do with health professions? So curricula gets reoriented to build in that aspect so that the students are experiencing something in their day-to-day -day experience where they understand the relevance for the careers that they're interested in pursuing. So that's the work that we are doing. We are trying to build a significant field. There are policy elements to this, as you can imagine, and we've been successful working with policymakers in Sacramento on this. There is building public will and bringing all sectors together to see the value of this kind of approach. And obviously, there's on-the-ground work that we are doing um, in these nine districts. But we're excited about it. It's, it's a lot of work, as you can imagine. We have invested probably close to 60 to $70 million in this particular area over the last six to seven years. And we are committed to continuing this work uh, for the foreseeable term. That's fascinating. What's, what's particularly interesting about this, though, is that it's also occurring against the backdrop of the radical defunding of the education system in California. And for those of us who are, I mean, I'm originally from the East Coast, and we always looked to California as being a leader on elementary and secondary education, public school education, as well as the university system. What's happened to that? Talk a little bit about the defunding. Talk a little bit about the sort of the, the challenges of governance that that suggests. So people have said that obviously the higher education system in California was viewed as the, the jewel of higher education, public higher education in the United States. 
Uh, there was a master plan that was developed in the 1960s that would provide access to all students to one of three systems, the community college system, which is a two-year system, the California State University, which is a four-year system, and then the University of California, which as many of you may know has ten campuses across California, including campuses at UCLA and uh, Berkeley, which are well regarded for um, their research acumen. Uh, these systems have been defunded significantly in the last number of years because of the economic crisis that has hit the country, but in particular because of the way the crisis has played out and in, in California. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with California politics, California governance, or California fiscal policy, <laughs> but any of those subjects would lead any of us uh, to a very dark place uh, if we spend a lot of time uh, on them. But this is probably a nice pivot to another area of interest for our foundation, which is how do we reform the governance and fiscal policy system in California? Um, and that's another area of emphasis. So while we're not focused specifically on dealing with the higher education defunding question, the work that we are doing at the state level in trying to look at governance reform and fiscal policy reform, we believe has a direct impact if it's done right in terms of our ability to restore the funding to the higher education system. So let me take a moment to describe what we are doing in this regard because it's a really interesting project and it's interesting how we got here. About six years ago, um, we convened a group of foundations in California who were funding in various areas, healthcare, environment, education, civil rights, social justice, um, environment, the, the broad, broad range. And we all sat down, and these were CEOs of major foundations across the state, and we all sat down and we realized that the work that we were doing was being compromised in very significant ways by a system of governance and fiscal policy in the state that was ineffective, that was broken, and that was dysfunctional. Um, and I'm, even though I'm being taped here today, I feel quite, uh, I feel fine saying that because I don't think anybody would dispute it. So what we did is the five, five foundations, the Hewlett Foundation, the Packard Foundation, the California Endowment, the Haas Jr. Fund, and the Irvine Foundation came together and created an entity called California Forward. California Forward was intended to bring together a bipartisan group. The original co-chairs of California Forward were Leon Panetta, who at the time was retired and had returned to California. This is before he was called back to service by the president. And Tom McKernan, who's a well-regarded uh, Republican leader uh, and the head of, our, um, of, of AAA of Southern California in Orange County. And Tom and Leon came together, built a terrific leadership council, and really started the process of working at two levels. One was, how do we build greater grassroots understanding of why governance reform and fiscal policy reform matters to everyday Californians. A lot of people don't see the linkage and we wanted them to understand that linkage better. And then second, really see how we could work effectively at a policy level to really advance public policies that we thought would lead to a more effective governance and fiscal policy system in the state. Now some changes have occurred. I wouldn't attribute all of these to California Forward, but it's worth noting that in the last five years, the following initiatives have passed in California. We have passed redistricting in California, both for local legislative races as well as for congressional races, which took basically the power to draw those districts out of the hands of legislators and put them into the hands of an independent citizen commission. And we are now, in fact, we have an election today and we're beginning to see what these redrawn districts are meaning in terms of the kinds of candidates that are now attracted to run in districts that are no longer, if you will, have been gerrymandered for particular parties. Second, we passed a top two primary in California, which effectively means that we have a primary today. The top two candidates, regardless of party affiliation, will move on to the general election in November. What that does is in a district that is more heavily Democratic or more heavily Republican, you're able to draw more moderate candidates because it's possible that you're going to have two Democrats or two Republicans competing in the general election. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out over the next number of months. In fact, the New York Times just did an article on this in the last couple of days. Um, we passed an initiative that finally allowed us to pass a state budget by majority vote as opposed to a two-thirds vote. California was the only state in the country that required a two-thirds vote for passage of the budget and to raise taxes. Um, and this led to incredible gridlock, as you can imagine. So at least we now have a majority vote to pass the budget. And in fact, last year, the budget was passed on time for the first time in years. So we're beginning to see some effects. And today, voters will vote on a term limits initiative 
that on the one hand will reduce the, the term that people can serve in the state legislature from 14 years to 12 years, but on the other hand will permit them to serve the full 12 years in one house of the state legislature. That's currently not the case. You're limited to two terms in the Senate and three terms in the Assembly. Now you can serve all 12 years in one house. The merit of that is you begin to build institutional knowledge in that house so you can actually work with people in some kind of constructive way. So the work that we are trying to do is really, again, build grassroots understanding so people understand the relevance of these issues, but also advance a set of policy changes and fiscal policy and, fiscal policy and budget changes that we think ultimately lead to a more effective system. California Forward, which we support, also has a related C4 entity called the California Action Fund. We cannot fund, we cannot be involved with the Action Fund because it's a lobbying entity, but that entity has successfully has successfully put together an initiative. It, has, it is gathering signatures right now. It is likely that that will qualify for the November ballot. And that initiative has a number of reforms to our budget system, two-year budgeting, pay-go provisions, which means the legislature can't add programs of $25 million or more without a dedicated revenue source for those programs, and a number of other changes that many people would describe as relatively incremental and common sense, and that we think would ultimately lead to a healthier system. Long answer to a short question, it's going to take us a long time to restore what Jane is describing, but we think we're laying the groundwork to get there eventually. I want to also bring you to some of the work you've been doing with Aspen. You're a member of the, um, uh, on the of Aspen Philanthropy Group, which is uh, composed of, of a variety of presidents of major foundations. And one of the things you've been focusing on is how best to evaluate uh, the grants you make at Irvine Foundation, how to think about that in a, um, in a, in a way that engages the full foundation and goes beyond sort of the notion of one person who just has to think about that at one point in the grant. So can you say something about your philosophy when it comes to uh, measurement and, and evaluation? Great. So a few years ago, in, as I said, in 2003, we adopted a strategic plan focused in three areas, arts, youth, and California democracy. And as we were starting to launch programs related to that plan, I went back to the board in 2005, so about 18 months into this work, and said to them, I think we should put together a small ad hoc task force of board members to work with the senior staff to really look at the question, how are we going to know we're having impact as an institution on these issues? And we formed this task force to develop a framework that would help us to understand our performance as a foundation. And let me distinguish our performance as a foundation from evaluation of individual grants. Obviously, we monitor every single grant that we make. We evaluate formally a number of grants and initiatives um, that we support. But I was actually interested in taking it a level above that and thinking about, as a foundation, how do we think about how we measure and assess our progress as an institution? So that led us, after a period of time working with this ad hoc task force, to put together um, a framework that has six parts to it and that we now report annually to our board on these parts. And we post that report publicly on our website every year. In fact, in the last several weeks, we've posted our 2011 report. And in fact, in this piece, which I'll let Jane speak to, which all of you have, um, I reflect on some of the lessons learned uh, from this work. But what are some of the questions that, that this assessment framework looks at? We look at clearly the most fun the, the fundamental question we look at is how are we doing against the outcomes that we're seeking uh, to have in the areas that we are funding in. So clearly we are reporting out on an annual basis on particular program initiatives. We look at progress indicators. So to the extent we're looking at a five-year effort, we will try to identify annual progress indicators so we can see whether we're making progress along certain dimensions. Clearly we report out on that. But there are a number of other elements that are interesting here. We also report on the context for our work. So every year we do a piece both for ourselves and for our board that looks at other external indicators in our three program areas that helps us to understand funding patterns, that helps us to understand other issues that might be going on in and around education or arts or the fiscal policy work that we're doing, and that I think helps the board to situate our work in a much broader context and encourages us to always keep our eye on that broader context rather than just being very narrow and putting our blinders on and just focusing on our programmatic work. We also look at how the foundation is exercising leadership. 
And I say that not in an egotistical way. It's not about Irvine drawing attention to Irvine, but it's rather Irvine embracing an obligation that we have to help to frame the conversation about the work that we're doing, to share learning that we, that we are accumulating in the work that we're doing. We have a very, um, a very deep commitment to transparency, both when things go well and when things don't go well. And we've done a lot of sharing of things that haven't gone well over the years. Um, and at times, it's pretty lonely doing that. But on the other hand, I think it's important for foundations to demonstrate that level uh, of transparency. We also look at, obviously, fin financial indicators, return on endowment. But we look at staff indicators. We report out on turnover. We report on staff and board diversity, because we happen to believe that that's a deeply held value for our institution to maintain a diverse board and staff. And we're very pleased with the progress that we have made there. We also look at an area called constituent feedback where we try to hold ourselves accountable every year to engaging in some kind of activity that allows us to learn from some constituent or stakeholder that we work with. So the Center for Effective Philanthropy, which many of you may be familiar with, does these grantee perception reports. We participated in those. This year, we're doing a stakeholder assessment report where we've identified about 90 thought leaders across the state, and in some cases, across the country. And we've asked them confidentially and in a qualitative way to share their impressions of the work of the foundation, to give us advice about how we might be better. And we will prepare that for our board, and we will obviously share that publicly uh, as well. And then finally, every year we take a step back and we say, what have we learned from our work, and how does that affect our work going forward? So how might we refine and adapt our strategies based on what we're learning? We are very much of the belief at the Irvine Foundation, and I happen to believe that this is a direction that philanthropy broadly is going to need to embrace in the kind of environment that we find ourselves. We are very much of the belief that the more adaptable and flexible we can be as an institution, and our ability to adjust and refine our work as the environment around us shifts is a very important attribute and competency to have as a foundation. So the report, uh, the, the piece that Jane has here um, in, in this document is a piece that a colleague and I wrote which describes what I just described obviously more articulately than I just did, but it also has um, some lessons that we've learned from the work. That's great. Thank you so much, Jim. And let's just focus in on this beneficiary feedback concept real quickly. Because earlier you talked about a case where you uh, are in essence design a program based on feedback from the ultimate benefit, the intended beneficiaries. Um, and this, this has become, and, and now when it comes to evaluating progress, this has become kind of a new norm, starting with, I think of the Gates Foundation mm -hmm. coming up with Youth, Youth Truth, Truth right. as a way to evaluate their educational programs. Do you expect that going forward we're going to see more and more of that sort of test touching base with the beneficiary instead of relying solely on numbers? I think, I think it's a really interesting, it's been interesting to watch what Gates has done with Youth Truth, which I think is a very um, innovative and creative project, really going to the population they're trying to serve. And I guess before we make the leap to saying how might foundations more effectively understand their beneficiaries and, and get feedback from them, there's, so, there's sort of a previous step that I might say philanthropy still needs to develop better muscles at. And that's the step of, as you're designing a strategy or thinking about engaging in an area of work, that you're going out to the field and learning from people who are engaged in that work on an ongoing basis. I think that's a place where foundations are often criticized for coming up with solutions in their own offices and only convening a very small group of experts or other leaders that they maybe have relationships with, and maybe not going as deeply or broadly into the areas, into, pop, you know, into regions and to touch populations that you're ultimately trying to affect in your work. Now, that's different from the youth truth work, which is really looking at the feedback of those beneficiaries after grants have been made. I'm even suggesting you ought to think about that in a strategy development process. Um, one other just a question on the, on the practice of philanthropy, then we'll turn to the, the room as a whole, to the group as a whole. With all this focus on results, all this focus on outcomes, is there a risk that an unintended consequence of that could be the reduction of risk taking? Or a tendency, A, to fund in areas where you know you're going to have impact, fairly easy impact, and B, to follow strategies that are already tested? So it's a, I mean, that's the right question to be asking. And in fact, we just had a board retreat in March with our board. We're using this year, 2012, to take a step back and take stock of a number of, in a number of areas across the foundation. And so we did a session with our board around the future of philanthropy. Uh, we brought together 
uh, three leaders uh, who have really thought about this question. Catherine Fulton with the Monitor Institute. Monitor, as you may know, put out a report a number of years ago called What's Next for Philanthropy? And so we wanted her to reflect on that work. Uh, Lucy Bernholz, whom you may know, who's with Arabella Philanthropy Advisors, and prior to that had founded Blueprint um, R&D. And Lucy really is much more connected as well to kind of technology trends and the role of social media, as well as just a broad thinker on the issue of philanthropy. And then Brad Smith, who's the president of the Foundation Center um, and has been a grant maker himself. So we brought the three of them together and compiled a lot of materials to share with our board. And one of the, one of the main outcomes that our board took away from that work when we debriefed after words was we need to have a higher tolerance for risk in this organization. We need to be more, and, and it's a bit of a trite term to say we need to be more innovative, but I think what the board was acknowledging is we need to, the future of philanthropy is going to be about risk taking. And if you're going to be the kind of nimble organization that I described a few minutes ago, it's going to entail maybe not developing the most thoughtful logic model um, and thoroughly thought through strategy that takes two years and involves lots of consultants before you can actually make your first grant. Maybe there's going to be some you know, iterative work that's going to take place. And the board got quite taken by this notion of rapid prototyping and saying to us, you know, maybe what we ought to do is find some ideas where we want to just start making some grants and then learn from that and then build on that going forward. That would be a very different style for us at the foundation and I think very exciting, uh, but we need to think through what that looks like. So I think this is going to remain a big issue going forward for foundations, but I think it has to start with a foundation taking a step back and saying, what does risk mean to us? Because I would argue that every foundation probably has a different way of thinking about what risk means in terms of risk of failure, in terms of reputational risk, which for many institutions that may be the, the core concern that they have, um, in terms of risk of wasting resources, in terms of risk of opportunity cost. If we fund here, we don't fund there. So I think really stepping back and having that conversation about how you define risk in your setting is, I think, the first step in then figuring out where risk fits in your grant making. The number of smiles and nodding heads around that answer was and a sense of relief that a foundation is taking the lead in that in that area. I think it's important. You've, you've written, Jim, that the, that the role of a foundation is to listen and to synthesize and to share. Tell us what that means. Great. So all of those concepts, and I'll speak about each of them in a moment, I think really come down to a core value that I happen to bring to this work. And I've been in this, I've been privileged to be in this role now for nine years. And it really is the value of humility. These are really privileged institutions to be a part of. Uh, all of us in this room in some way or another are connected to private philanthropy. And how wonderful that our tax code permits these institutions to exist. Um, and what a privileged role to steward these resources for public benefit. And I happen to be of the belief that the very best foundations are those that embrace this spirit of humility in the work that they carry out. And so as a result, Jane's referring to a, a blog post I did um, a number of months ago where I was reflecting about the attributes of effective philanthropy. And I kind of landed on this idea of sharing, synthesizing, and learning and said that from my experience, it's when foundations are really sharing openly and candidly and transparently what they're learning through their work that they can be effective. It's when foundations take this privileged role that they're in where they have access to lots of information, lots of talented people, and they think about how do I capture that information and synthesize it and reflect it back to the field. We did a study about six years ago in the arts um, about critical issues facing the arts and in California. And I would say all we did, and I'm, I don't mean to demean the work that we did, but all that we did was to talk to a number of smart people in this area and read a number of studies that had already been produced and reflect those back in a synthesized study that said, here are the five big issues facing the arts. And you would have thought that we had delivered some unknown set of um, truths to the arts field because people were so grateful for having in one place this synthesis of a lot of good work that had been done by others. And I think that's another important role that you can play. And then sharing, of course, is, is just critical. Uh, I've spoken a lot about transparency, and I happen to believe that that ought to be a core value. Uh, it's a core value for us. 
um, but really finding ways to share lessons that we're learning. And I think increasingly foundations also have to be better at telling stories. I think we're hearing more and more that with no disrespect to many people in the room, many of my good friends in the room who focus on data, that we also need to really focus and look at the way we tell our story, the way we shape narrative about the impact we're having as foundations. Thank you so much, Jim. What I'd like to do is open it up because I realize I'm looking around the room and surrounded by experts in each of the issue areas where you work, as well as in philanthropy itself and the practice of philanthropy. Um, so I am going to open it up and call on you. And remember, Jane, they have to push their button. Yes. You've got to be better at this than I am. <laughs> and I should note that Janet Sapolsky, who runs a, a program that takes a deep dive on, on communities and community solutions, Ross Weiner from uh, our education program, Lisa Mensa looks at economic uh, Aaron Bailey from Native American Youth. Aaron, um, there's David Devlin Fulce who focuses on the practice of philanthropy. So you are surrounded. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Boris from, um, uh, from Urban Institute. So you really are surrounded. Jane, could I just maybe pull yep. rank And then Dale after you. you. Yeah, I'm sorry. You go first, then Dale. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you. Um, just to, to continue, Jim, on you, you, you mentioned the arts. And we had a chance just before for me to share with Jim that the Aspen Institute is, has a much re, reinvigorated program in the arts that, and actually it's about to expand. Interested in a couple of respects. One, how a foundation where usually when uh, my experience is when arts is a, is a, is a focus of a foundation, it's, it's sort of in the, in the bylaws or it's in the founding document or it's the founder's interest in the arts. So I'm wondering how engagement in the arts was something that, that, that you developed. And secondly, for a foundation that is so focused on outcomes and, and impact, how, how you deal with those issues in an area like the arts, which is much more challenging uh, at least many people think much more challenging to show impact, mm -hmm. even though we believe it's compelling. It's, it's not as quantifiable. So why arts and, and, and how do you square, uh, square it with outcome and, and impact? So the foundation's focus on the arts, while James Irvine did not stipulate that arts would be an area of focus, um, our board has historically, and even more recently, nine years ago, uh, come to the conclusion that if we are about a vibrant California, we need to be about the arts. And this is just a stake in the ground. It's a deeply held value for our institution. It's one that I happen to, um, to share, even though it's not necessarily my decision. It's the board's decision. But I'm thrilled that we maintain a very significant um, engagement in the arts in California. But that, sh that, that focus has shifted just in the last uh, 6 to 12 months. And I want to share a little bit about how it shifted and then use that as a means of getting to your question about outcomes. We have been doing some work over the last number of years to understand how the arts field has been evolving. And at least in California, and I suspect this is true across the country as well, we've come to the conclusion that the combination of demographic change and technological change are going to have profound, a, a profound impact on the work of arts organizations. So where we start our work is how do we help arts organizations in California remain vibrant, remain relevant, remain sustainable. And we're of the view that these trends, demographic and technological, are going to have a significant impact on the work that they do. So now the focus of our program is really how do we help arts organizations to adapt to this new reality. And we have focused this work around the question of engagement, how people engage in the arts. And we've talked about sort of three core questions that we're going to be exploring and funding in the next number of years around engagement. We want to look at who engages in the arts. And in particular, we want to find out how we can more effectively engage lower income and more diverse populations in the arts in California. We also happen to believe that for any arts organizations, their capacity to engage those audiences are going to be critical to their future, particularly audiences that are diverse. So that's who engages. We're also looking at where engagement takes place. It's really no longer a truism that to engage in the arts means you have to go to a museum or a concert hall 
or an arts institution. But arts happens everywhere. It happens in our churches, our community centers, in our homes, in our plazas. And so we're trying to figure out how arts organizations think about this question of where engagement takes place to think about their programming in a way that might get them outside of their walls. And we happen to believe, by the way, that when they get outside of their walls, they also address the question of who engages. And then we're looking at the question, so the who, the where, and we're looking at how people engage. And here again, there's a piece of work, and we've published a study called Getting In on the Act, which is on our website, which when we posted it again, I think the arts field is just hungry for research because it received over 2,000 hits and downloads on our website within a few months. Um, Getting In on the Act is a piece of research that is looking at how engagement in the arts is changing and really shifting from a more kind of passive, ambient engagement where we were accustomed to showing up, sitting in a seat, having art by experts delivered to us. We had a wonderful experience and then we left and it was generally within, if we went to a concert, it was within a two to two and a half hour time frame. In San Francisco, if you go to the San Francisco Symphony, it's done by 10 because of union rules. So, you know, it's very contained in terms of how the art experience occurs. Or if you go to a museum, obviously there's a curator that's decided what you should see and then you go and you experience this art. This research is really looking at how people are engaging very differently and wanting to engage very differently in terms of playing a more active role, in terms of art making themselves, in terms of curating. And curating may sound like this very um, ephemeral, very artistic concept, but let me just ask all of you a question. How many of you have some kind of iPod or MP3 player where you listen to music? How many of you have one of those? Just don't be shy, it's okay. <laughs> And how many of you have created your own playlists for those iPods or MP3 players? Welcome to the curation uh, <laughs> industry. You are all curators. And so the point is, we're not talking about complicated knowledge that one needs to have. I'm sure you all have great knowledge about your music. But we're not talking about expert knowledge. We're talking about different ways that people can engage with art that we think, again, will fundamentally change the way arts organizations are working, and that's our emphasis. So how are we going to be able to tell that we're making a difference? We're really going to be looking at how organizations are successfully adapting to this change. We're going to be funding a number of pilot efforts across the state um, in order to see who's doing what to test a number of ideas. And then we're ultimately going to build to funding perhaps a smaller number of organizations over time that are really doing this successfully so that we can learn from those particular successful ventures what it takes to build the kind of DNA in your institution at all levels to be the kind of relevant organization that I think you're going to need to be in view of the changes I described earlier. Thanks so much. I'm going to turn now to Dale. And uh, then Kirk is right after. Is that right? Okay. Uh, I should be asking about your uh, work on impact and monitoring and evaluation because that's my field. I'm with the American Red Cross. And all I will say is it resonates, it resonates. Program level sharing, stories, rapid prototyping, constituent feedback. But I'm going to ask a question that just struck me immediately when you talked about the education area, which is not my field. So if you have these youth and they're all in scrubs and they're doing a different educational experience, uh, what are the implications for the teachers? How do you get the teachers? How do you train the teachers? Are there different types of teachers? And how does this work into the model? It's, it's, a, it's a great question because, as I said earlier, the investments that we're making um, are really looking at how you think about all components of the high school experience, and it includes teacher. It includes, obviously, instruction. And so, for example, one of the things that we are doing is running these teacher institutes over the summer where we bring together teachers who are committed to linked learning, who are eager to implement this in their schools, in their districts, and who want to learn how they can do this differently, what it means for their curriculum, what it, how they have to reshape their curriculum, how they might build in a work-based experience um, into what they're doing, how they have to collaborate differently potentially with other teachers because part of what makes these pathway schools, and we use the term pathways because there are a number of industry pathways, healthcare is one, there's media and entertainment, there's IT, all of these various industry pathways that we're building linked learning around, it's, it requires the schools to work in a much more concerted fashion and for teachers in particular to work in a more integrated fashion which having been a high school teacher and I taught for five years I can tell you team teaching is far more difficult than teaching on your own 
Um, so imagine not just team teaching, two of you teaching one course, but in this case, really bringing together people across different fields to think together about how they deliver this healthcare pathway experience to their students. I'm going to, first, Russ, did you want to comment on that, or can I turn? No, turn it. It's a, it's a, sorry. It, it's a huge challenge. Um, the, and, and right, trying to get teachers to embrace this new way, and at the same time, figuring out how that meshes with uh, the, the pressure for accountability and results that they're feeling right now, uh, figuring out how to balance that is a huge challenge in the field. So we turn to Kirk and then to Alan. Alan, why don't you step up and borrow uh, Ross's um, uh, microphone when you're ready. Okay, um, I guess this is uh, a question that's related to um, um, education and uh, there's, a, there's a group that we do a small grant for uh, called BUILD and they work in D.C. and Oakland and it has to do with teaching entrepreneurship skills to kids that are not on a track to graduate. And it, you struck a chord with me because it was the same idea that kids who are just not relating to the curriculum but you know you say well you could actually earn some money here and you could you could start a business and we'll help you do that and, and by the way if you want to do that you know there's a little math involved so we're going to talk about math and, and well you have to write a little bit about your business plan so we'll do a little writing here and it brings people in and apparently he's been quite successful in graduation rates in in Oakland and now into DC programs and I wondered if that if there's a fit anywhere in there that you're aware of with teaching entrepreneurs to this group of kids so we're familiar with a number of these, um, with, a, with a number of efforts. I mean, BUILD is, is certainly one. Um, there, there are a number of other projects that we're funding that are outside of linked learning. So many of you may, may be familiar with Year Up, because I know you have a Year Up program here in Washington, D.C. We also have one. We've been funding the expansion of Year Up in California. And this is obviously a, a, a yet another effort to engage youth more directly in a work-based experience and working with employers to create those opportunities. And not just a work-based experience where they show up and then do something but no one's really paying any attention to them but rather a work-based experience where the employer is deeply committed to developing their skills and potentially having them become full-time employees uh, down the line and really building the workforce in that particular industry so I think there is something um, to that and I do think it comes back I continue to be focused on this question of relevance um, that it really is about how you create an experience for youth that they see as relevant to their lives. And whether it's build, whether it's year up, whether it's what we're doing in linked learning, at the heart of it is this issue of how you make it relevant. And yesterday when we had the panel of youth, and these were all youth who'd come from very disadvantaged circumstances and very difficult, uh, dif difficult lives themselves and have, had all been very successful, what you heard from them, one of the common themes that, that ran through their comments was how much they want to be respected. And I think in some ways, what we're trying to do with linked learning and what I think BUILD is doing, what I think Year Up is doing, is providing an experience that respects where these students are and is really trying to enable them to move to the next level. These youth will say to you, we're not looking for a handout, we're not looking for someone to do something for us, but we are looking to be respected, to be listened to, um, and hopefully to have experiences that are relevant to our lives. So Alan and, and then David. Um, thanks. Jim, um, you mentioned the, uh, the importance of storytelling. Um, and what I'm wondering about is the, is the story that foundations uh, are or perhaps should be telling uh, in terms of their role in society as important institutions. Um, <clears throat> in particular, you know, one might think that the traditional view of foundations is that they're innovators, uh, they, they go out and do demonstration programs, show things that may work, and that government is the one that, that picks them up, takes them to scale, that sort of thing. Um, well, you know, in this day and age, uh, you know, government, I wouldn't say, is exactly in the pickup stage. <laughs> you know, we're, we're in for a few, year, few it's years a of drop off backs. stage. Yeah, drop off stage, right. Um, so, so then, what is it foundations are doing? Um, are, they, are, they, do, are they continuing to innovate? Uh, if yes, what's happening to those innovations? Um, I'm sure they don't want to be left caught you know, picking up for government, uh, you know, putting, putting money where government really should be doing it. So what, what's the, and I know it's an oversimplify, I'm asking you to oversimplify, but that's what stories are. So what, you know, what is the role of foundations in our society today? 
That's an easy question. <laughs> Boy, thank you, Alan. It's good to see you, too. <laughs> Um, boy, I, I, I will not be so presumptuous to try and answer to that, but, but let me just may, let me say a few things uh, building on, on, that, on that question, and I, and I will try to answer it. Um, some of you may be familiar with work that the Philanthropy Awareness Initiative, PAI, did a number of years ago where they went out, uh, this was supported by foundations, but they went out to try to understand what does the public understand about foundations and philanthropy, and what you discovered is the public really doesn't understand much at all about foundations philanthropy. They don't know what foundations are. They don't know what foundations do. Um, and some of this research was, in essence, also trying to understand as we thought about more legislative interest in foundations or the increasing focus on foundations, just ensuring, so what does the public know? Is the public going to help us? Are they going to protect us? And the fact is people don't understand what foundations do. So I think that's, there is in that something that I think foundations need to be attentive to in terms of how we more effectively talk about the contributions we make. And I would argue the contributions we make are not necessarily what our institutions do, but it's the work that we are privileged to enable in communities across this country. And that's the line that I'm focused on. But I think you're getting to another question, which I think is a very difficult one. I think in this focus in the last decade or so, you know, it's been more than a decade that we've been focused on results and impact and outcomes, but I think the last decade has seen even more of an emphasis on those, that particular set of principles. I think it is leading more and more foundations to take a much more narrow, targeted, focused approach, and some would argue to be setting and driving the agenda much more than enabling the community's agenda or the agenda of the field. Um, and I'm not here to necessarily say that one is better than the other, but I would observe that it seems to me, having been in this field for a number of years and now in this role for almost a decade, that I think we are seeing more of that. Now, whether Irvine could be accused of that, one might argue we could, because we've gone from six program areas down to three. I described to you today some pretty focused initiatives. I hope that they are initiatives that are grounded in what the community needs, and we tried to be attentive to that. But on the other hand, we have only have $68 million a year. It may sound like a lot, but we're in California, huge state of 38 million people, huge state of need, um, and we're trying to figure out what are the handful of areas where we can make some kind of difference. So for us, what we're about, and this may be an answer at least for Irvine, if not for the field, is trying to be clear about what we're trying to achieve, trying to hold ourselves accountable to the goals that we've set for ourselves, sharing lessons and sharing what is failing in that work, and hopefully when the work concludes, being very open-eyed about what made it successful or, if this happens, what, what didn't work for us and what we learned from that experience. And I think, but I think underneath all of that, there needs to be this focus on enabling the broader community and enabling the partners that we're privileged to support. And that remains a core value for us at Irvine, and I'm hopeful that the philanthropic community will continue to see that as really the important area they should be focusing their attention. I should note that the Aspen Philanthropy Group has been looking at the question of how you set a standard for foundation transparency. And what's so striking is that in all the interviews we've, we've, uh, we've undertaken, the feedback is continually that the Irvine Foundation is, is way ahead of others in this, in this regard. So the question was to the right person. Um, I'm going to go to Irene, then um, to Heather, and then to Larry. But I'm sorry, we first have David Devonfaults and then Irene. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Uh, as Jane said, there's lots of appreciative nodding when you were speaking about both, speaking and expressing, I think, both your, humil hu your humility about uh, the foundation's work and also your willingness to take on um, rapid prototyping or, as other people put it, fail fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just in light of that, be because there is a strong focus on advocacy and policy change, which often takes a really long time, right? And you, you're, you're really enabling people to be ready for the moment when that window opens. So how do you balance, or how will you balance as you move into this new, new focus, uh, perhaps, uh, on, on fail fast versus having the patience to see something through? Great. And, be, and before I suggest in today's comments that we're moving toward rapid prototyping um, or the fail fast effort, I mean, this is an idea that is just beginning to, to sort of germinate, if you will, within the organization, and we need to give more thought to it. And I would welcome thoughts from people in this audience if you have experiences uh, with that. But I think this question of how 
you know, how foundations do that kind of work effectively and then how you balance the short term with the long term is really at the heart of what makes this work challenging. Um, because we are indeed focused on some very long-term goals that we know are going to take time and our board is very patient around the work in governance reform, around the work with linked learning to know that that's kind of a decade plus investment and the board gets that. So where we've tried to strike that, that, that balance is to say yes we're focused on the long term but we are willing to adapt and refine our strategies and so to use your example when a policy window opens we're going to try to leap through that policy window. And if it means that a plan, so for example, the work of California Forward might have originally thought that, gee, we ought to work on initiative reform. Initiative reform is a big problem in California. As you know, we have an initiative system. It's been around for 100 years. It allows, in theory, it's allowing the general public to be able to bring ideas to the electorate. In effect, what it has done is it's, it's basically for sale. And so if you've got $3 million, you can get something on the, on the ballot. Um, so initiative reform was originally something that we were interested in doing through California Forward and what we realized is notwithstanding that master plan we needed to focus on budget reform because that was the, the opportunity that we saw. So being able to be nimble in that respect but in the context of the direction you're trying to go in, I think that's the balance we're trying to strike. Conversely, I think we are trying to avoid becoming a flavor of the month foundation. Uh, I do think that there tends to be a tendency for people to get very excited and this is why I made my caveat about rapid prototyping because I think you start to get excited about something and all of a sudden momentum shifts there and you're doing that because that's sort of the flavor of the month and I think we need to be cautious to not fall into that trap but that tension that you describe is really one of the core tensions I think for any foundation executive, for the board, for the senior staff. So I've got five hands and now a six, so I'm going to group together the questions and start with Irene and then Heather, and we will get there. Irene. These huge issues and are making progress on them. And I am wondering what techniques did you use to, uh, to move public opinion forward like this? That is, to me, is startling. And I'd love to hear about some specifics. Well, let me not leave. Oh, sorry. So you want to take, take one more Heather's question? And then go back to you. Heather? Um, so my question is in a different direction. Um, actually, I have a question about your uh, relationship and your work with your board. Um, just in some of the comments you made, Jim, it sounds like you have a unique partnership and I know a lot of times um, people perceive foundation boards as being barriers to change where it, seems, it sounds like you've really been able to leverage your board as an agent for change within the foundation. So I was hoping you could comment on that relationship. Great. Why don't I just take them in, in that order and I'll try to be quick, Jane. Um, I mean, look, if I, if I felt my board was a barrier to change, then I should not be there. I mean, in essence, because my role isn't to try to change them, you know, so, so I would just say that as an outset. And, and I do find, I, I think language is really important. And I, I often hear CEOs, not just foundation CEOs, but CEOs in general talk about managing their board. And I frankly, I kind of find it offensive because I think it's about engaging your board. And the approach that, that I've taken at Irvine has been how do I work effectively with this talented group of people who have a huge amount of value to add to our work um, to bring out the best that they have to offer and obviously they're relying on a paid staff to take those ideas and shape them and reflect them back and that's been the orientation that I've brought to that work and maybe being a classroom teacher has influenced that because I often think of board meetings as kind of a lesson plan and it's not a lesson plan in the sense that I have knowledge to impart it's more of a lesson plan in terms of thinking about how do I get from here to there and how do I structure our time together in a way that's going to maximize their engagement and participation um, and they're very clear that when they're sharing ideas they're not expecting me to then accommodate 14 ideas and go to lowest common denominator nobody's interested in that but they are interested in being authentic partners in this work um, to your question let me not leave the impression that somehow we made all of this happen because that is definitely not the case I think we were fortunate in that California Forward came online at a moment in time where people realized that this system of governance and fiscal reform was broken. And so I think there was already momentum that was beginning to build. But I think the contribution that California Forward has made is to think really thoughtfully about the additional reforms that we can build on the ones that I, that I described earlier, 
but also thinking about how you build, and this is more specifically now, how do you build community engagement and understanding? And again, it's about the relevance of these arcane policy issues to the day-to-day -day lives, particularly of low-income minority Californians who often don't vote in the same kinds of numbers as others. And so part of it is understanding why a two-thirds budget matters to folks in the community. And that's part of the work that California Forward has done, meeting with people across the state, in regions, in community centers, to help educate people and to engage them in coming up with some of the solutions. So that's been a pretty specific approach that they have used. So we're turning helps. to Larry, and then you have the microphone, I hope. Yes, so Larry, and then you. OK, uh, Jim, I'd like to talk uh, or ask a question about the linked learning, which I find fascinating and sounds like it's really much needed. And whenever I think that, I think, oh, there may be an issue here, which is what I want to talk about. Um, and that has to do with unintended negative consequences. Uh, are there things that you're looking for or that you may have found? One of the things that distinguishes the traditional American educational system is that we don't track kids early. Uh, in my family, uh, we have a foster son from Romania who joined us when he was 16. Uh, and he came over and he'd been tracked at age 13 uh, into going into math and science. He came to uh, this country and was just blown away. My God, I can take a course in something else. Uh, he's since not gone down a very dark path and is running a foundation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, when you have this, you know, if, if you look at the option as I'm going to drop out or I'm going to go to the local high school that isn't meeting my needs or I'm going to go into a health career thing, are there problems there that perhaps you did not anticipate that are starting to show up? So we are we have been very sensitive to this question um, of unintended consequences, and in particular the question about tracking. And I think one of the criticisms of vocational education as it has been known over time is that it was in many respects viewed as a, as a tracking mechanism, and it was viewed um, I'll just use the term, it was viewed as kind of a dumping ground for the students who were not able to succeed in a traditional high school. We are not interested in that. When I described earlier that this is about marrying a rigorous academic experience with a relevant technical experience, I really meant that about the rigor part. So what you described with BUILD, for example, your experience working with entrepreneurship and helping people to understand, well, wow, that involves writing and that involves arithmetic and that involves other skills. That's what we're focused on. We are preparing students in linked learning schools using the A to G curriculum, which is what makes you University of California eligible, which is a very rigorous academic program. That is at the core of linked learning. And that's where I think we've actually broken some new ground, is in being able to marry rigor with relevance so that we, we can create something that is successful. And, and there were lots of skeptics initially. There were skeptics from the College for All group, the people who feel that we were somehow undermining the College for All message. And College for All is a great message, but it is simply not a reality for many youth. We just need to acknowledge that. Um, we were also, uh, there were a number of people uh, who, support, who are deeply supportive of low-income minority populations in California who were concerned that we were tracking, so we had to show how this was not a tracking approach. There may be other unintended consequences that we haven't thought about, but I think we were very sensitive to the one you described because that was not what we wanted to do. We wanted to provide youth with the opportunity to then say when they graduated from that high school, I can go into a health profession or I'm now ready to go to a two or four year college and build on this experience and deepen my knowledge in this area. So we're going to take this, the last three. We're going to start with you, then we're going to move to Elizabeth and then to Kevin. And I think that'll probably be all we can squeeze in. Great. I'm Sally Redney. I'm with the Community Foundation for Montgomery County just up the road. And I'm um, helping facilitate a Petri dish effort to implement a, you know, and follow your model and pathways. And I'm just curious about some questions related to race, ethnicity, income, privilege, power, and implementing these kinds of things. Because as a community foundation, I'm working to encourage local philanthropists to invest in a pathways program in a school system that used to be for affluent white families for the most part, and now has a million people, more kids in poverty in Montgomery County than the total number of, in the school system, than the total number of kids in the DC public school system. It's rapid, unbelievable change in poverty. But a huge piece of it, it the 
Uh, diversity now is unbelievable diversity, 124 languages in the school system, huge Ethiopian, Cameroonian, other African communities, Latin American, Asian. And so in the path of doing all this, what do you do to make it not just about philanthropy when you're getting wealthy families to contribute, but be about this, we're, this is our community and we're investing in the future economy here. We're investing in the health care, all the aging seniors in Montgomery County who are affluent who are going to be cared for by who. Um, and also, you know, in the middle of that, you have the DREAM Act on the ballot. Um, so you're working on the, the community college and helping create access and creating these pathways, and then you've got these tricky things going on. So I just, I know I've sort of got a case study, but when you're really implementing this in the local level, there are so many of these issues. So are there Thank tricks, experiences? California is a great one for, for this. So I'm going to call on Elizabeth and then Kevin. Hi, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure to hear you speak today. Great to see you. I had a question about um, what I assume is your, your plan that I see in this uh, publication here, which is performance measurement that you're doing. It's something that I'm very interested in. I see it as a, a really uh, useful uh, evolution of evaluation, as we use the term. But I'm wondering how you, uh, if you do, try to implement this kind of performance measurement and management with your own grantees and how you see that playing out. And then finally, Kevin. Hi, uh, Kevin Laskowski with the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy. I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about your peers. You spoke of the uh, privileged position that foundations occupy in that they don't answer to the bottom line or the ballot. And you also spoke of the need for a growing risk tolerance. When foundations occupy a privileged position that allows them to be nimble, what exactly is holding foundations back from being just that? close with the three easy questions, right? There you go. That's a nice way. Let me try to handle these. I'm sensitive to time, so let me handle them in the order in which they came and try to do justice to them. To your question about the Petri dish um, that, you're, that you're working on, let me offer one response, and then let me offer, I, I think, a, perhaps even a more helpful response. A more helpful response is that our program director in the youth area, Ann Stanton, who's been driving and leading this work for us for the last seven years, would be a great contact for you. I mean, she's been in this every single day and I think could help to share some insights. But let me offer one short response. When we the way we frame our work in linked learning is we say we're funding in three domains. We're funding practice, so we're funding actual work linked learning happening in districts in California. We're funding policy. We're funding, uh, funding opportunities to develop research that informs public policy, that engages policymakers in understanding the linked learning approach. Ultimately, we see that as one of the ways we're going to get to success with this model. And we're funding public will. And the public will piece is very important because what we're doing there is trying to bring together, and this comes back to where I started the conversation on the White House Council, bring together leaders from all sectors to understand the importance and value of this approach in their community. And so it's business leaders, it's parents, um, it's people from the nonprofit sector that are working in and around these issues. So, and that is, that's hard work um, because it's really about constituent building, it's really about listening to people, it's really about engaging a broad cross-section. We can talk more about some of the things that we've learned there if that's helpful to you. Um, to Elizabeth on performance uh, measurement, we have indeed done a number of things obviously at the foundation and hopefully are making some progress. I think there's probably more that we can make. With regard to our grantees, I think it probably differs. I think there are some initiatives where we've been able to build in some pretty rigorous performance measurement systems. Linked learning is probably the best example because as you can imagine, we're trying to track a number of indicators in these school districts so we can understand the efficacy of this approach. We've hired SRI to work with us. So as you can imagine, it's a significant expensive evaluation but we think it's an important investment so we really can glean as much as we can from this. But in terms of our day-to-day -day work with grantees, I would say we haven't done a great deal in terms of infusing performance measurement into every single grant in large measure because I think we're often sensitive to how much we're imposing on our grantees beyond just the regular reporting that they might do. That, that's really the point of it because I think if it doesn't come from the grantees themselves and if they're not following and measuring things that are important to their success, then they're not going to maintain it over time. I would agree with that. And then let me go to your question about uh, my peers and, and risk and why people are, are not more nimble. And I guess um, 
It's a hard question for me to answer um, because I can't speak for my peers and everybody has different demands and different issues that they confront within their institutions. I can only speak for myself. I can also make the statement that I do wish people would be more risk taking um, in their work, that we do have this privileged role that we occupy and yet I acknowledge every foundation is different, different mandate, uh, different set of values. Uh, different set of uh, principles that they might be operating under, uh, different constraints that they may have, and I respect those. And so I think it just is up to every foundation to handle it however they think best. So let me just close by saying that I, I do commend to you uh, Jim's article that he wrote for this series we did for Stanford Social Innovation Review in which uh, the leaders of a group of, found of different foundations, of five different foundations, put forth their philosophy when it comes to measurement and evaluation. And let me just ask you to join me uh, in thanking Jim not only for the time uh, and thoughtfulness that he, uh, that he provided for us today, but also for his leadership in a sector. He's pretty remarkable. He's the best advertisement for hiring people when they're 36 I've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, so please join me in thanking Jim. Thank you very much.